Our subject is raising a global altar for educational transformation. Raising a global altar for educational transformation. That's our subject for tonight. Now, altars are spiritual infrastructure for securing destinies of individuals, institutions, and nations. We can't have dominion mandate without the infrastructure of altars. A spiritual infrastructure for securing the destiny of individuals, institutions, and nations. Now, because the Wailing Women is an international organization, it must raise a global altar if it desires to see education transformed in the nations. Now, it is against this background that we shall examine the concept of altars. And then we will concentrate on dealing with the kingdom dynamics for raising altars, particularly for transforming education in the nations. So first we'll look at the concept of altars. Then we'll concentrate on what dynamics do we need to put in place in order to raise the kind of educational altars that will transform the nations. Now, we shall do this against the background of Satan's attempt to raise counterfeit altars of darkness, especially at the citadels of learning. Now, let's look at the concept of an altar. An altar is a place of worship. An altar is a place of worship. And you would wonder, Educational institution should it be a place of worship? Worship is adoration. Worship is acknowledgement of a supreme being without whom we cannot survive. An altar is a place of communion and communication between spirits and man. That's what an altar is. Every altar is a place of communion between spirits and man. And whether you like it or not, there are evil spirits communing with man, both students and teachers at many educational institutions. And it's time for us to reverse that trend so that we as parents, we as teachers, we as educational administrators can begin to commune with the Holy Spirit in the attempt to transform nations and educational institutions. So understand that every altar is a place of worship. I can tell you with authority that Satan is being worshiped in certain institutions of higher learning or certain secondary schools or primary schools rather than God. And an altar is a place of cutting covenants whether they are personal covenants or they are generational covenants. And this altar we want to raise is an altar where we cut a covenant, an agreement with God on behalf of not just ourselves, but generations yet unborn. An altar is a place of making sacrifice. So we'll begin to see the dimension of the sacrifices we need to make at an educational altar with a sense of global transformation. So it's a place of making sacrifices. An altar, above all, is a spiritual highway linking heaven to earth. An altar is a spiritual highway linking heaven to earth. It reminds me of when Jacob came to an altar raised by Abraham, even as he took a stone as a pillow, suddenly he dreamt and he saw a ladder rising from the altar where he was sleeping onto heaven. And he saw angels ascending and descending, ascending and descending. So an altar is a place of angelic traffic. Is it possible 
that we can raise educational institutions, that the spirit of God and the angelic spirits will come and traffic, take knowledge from heaven and bring it down and take requests from the institutions back to heaven. It is possible. So briefly, an altar is a place of worship. An altar is a place of communion and communication between spirits. And the kind of altar we want to raise must be a global altar where we commune with the Holy Spirit, our teacher. An altar is a place of cutting covenants, personal and generational. An altar is a place of making sacrifices. An altar is a spiritual highway linking heaven to earth. Can I tell you that heaven has an educational system that earth needs? And you will need angelic traffic to bring the system of education in heaven to bear upon the earth. Now, having said that, the altar we raise must help enhance three dimensions of educational uh, 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 concept. One is education as a discipline. Education as a discipline. You know, here we're talking about a discipline uh, in the context of education. Education is a process. Again, depending on the altar you raise, you would understand how education is a process and education ultimately is a product. So there are three dimensions of understanding education. Education as a discipline, education as a process, education as a product. Now, as a discipline, it is the body of organized knowledge. As a discipline, education is the body of organized knowledge. We deal with who should teach, what should be taught, why should it be taught, how should it be taught, to whom should it be taught. Now, who should teach? Depending who you bring to teach, that will determine the type of altar you're raising. If you bring humanists or unbelievers to teach, you can be sure that you're not raising an altar that will bring transformation from the kingdom point of view. Depending on what you teach, if you teach perversion, if you teach the things that do not conform to scripture, again, you're raising an altar not unto God. So it's important to understand education as a discipline, the body of organized knowledge. Then education as a process. Again, this is important. Education as a process. It entails the development of the individual progressively, physically, spiritually, mentally, morally, emotionally, socially. In other words, education becomes the process, progressive dimensions of developing the mental capacity. That's a process. But ultimately, education is a product. It is the end result of the altar you have raised. If the end result of the altar you have raised is to raise people who are conscious of being naked, if the end result of the altar you have raised is to raise people who are immoral. It means you haven't raised an altar unto God, you have raised an altar to Satan. So don't forget that education as a discipline is the body of organized knowledge dealing with who should teach, what should be taught. Education as a process is a developmental system by which people grow spiritually, mentally, morally. The kind of altar you raise will determine whether they will grow mentally, morally, or spiritually. Education is a product, a product of the end result of behavior modification, character transformation. So having laid that foundation, let's look at the altar and idea of Christian education as a kingdom agenda. Because nobody raises an altar without an agenda. So let's examine the altar and the idea of Christian education as a kingdom agenda. Now, what's the central focus? Okay, let me not rush. Now, according to the website, 
calfellowship.org. A kingdom agenda can be defined as a visible demonstration of the comprehensive rule of God over every area of life. That's a kingdom agenda. It is visible. It's a demonstration of a comprehensive rule. A comprehensive rule. It involves focus, objective, purpose, direction, aim. So we are, for you to raise an altar, the altar must be to raise an idea of Christian education from the kingdom point of view. Kingdom point of view in the sense that it demonstrates comprehensive rule of God in people's spirit, soul, and body. So on this ground, what's the central focus of the altar we want to raise as a kingdom agenda? What's the central focus? What are we driving to do? What are we intending to achieve? What's our focus? If we say we're raising an altar, a global altar for transforming education, what's our central focus? For this altar to be a kingdom means of transforming lives. Let's look at a few things we will have to deal with. For the altar we raise to become an instrument of transformation, global transformation, we must establish the essence of life. It must establish the essence. So we're looking at establishing the essence of life. Secondly, we're looking at contending with humanist world view and agenda. If that altar will bring transformation, then we must contend with humanist world view and agenda because that's what currently is predominant. For this altar to be a kingdom-based altar that will bring to them, that was the promotion of educational philosophy from the Christ dimension. So remember, if we raise this altar for transforming education globally, it must teach those transform the essence of life. What's the essence of life? What's the meaning to life? It must contend with the opposing view because for every kingdom-based agenda that will bring transformation, there is another kingdom, the satanic kingdom, with its own agenda. So the altar will raise must be a mere means of contending. They must promote the educational philosophy of Christ. Then this altar must integrate the kingdom agenda in curriculum development. You know, what makes a school Christian? What makes an educational institution an altar raised unto the kingdom of God is not because that altar is raised by a Christian. No, it's not because Christian teachers teach there. It's because the curriculum for the transformation of the minds of the people must be kingdom. So again, for this altar we want to raise to bring transformation, it must ensure that the kingdom agenda is part of school management. So we're not just talking about curriculum, we're talking about management of the school. But more importantly, even in addition to all I said, it must combine the kingdom agenda with, with co-curricular. The word extracurricular is no more involved. Co-curricular activities, what the children do apart from the issue of uh, learning. So let's look at the the focus of establishing the essence of life as part of the altar we raise. Now, the essence of life is encoded in the questions of the question every worldview must answer. And I like uh, late Rabbi Zachariah's uh, concept of worldview. Every worldview must take, give us an idea of origins. Where did we come from? So if you're raising an educational altar for transformation and people don't know where they came from, it won't bring transformation. In other words, the issue of origins and currently the dominant altars of education in the world teach us that man is a product of spontaneous generation. There was a big bang, the big bang theory, and then one atom came up and transformed into man. 
that kind of educational altar will not bring transformation. So for the altar of education to bring global transformation, it must teach us about origins. And for us, origins is in God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So in other words, our origins are divine. For this altar to bring transformation, it must give meaning that so much suicide today because educational institutions are no longer giving meaning to people. That's why children are committing suicide, parents are committing suicide, there's no meaning to life. And I can say it even now that it is Christ that gives us meaning. For this altar to bring transformation and give us a, a knowledge about the essence of life, it must teach us about morality, right ways of doing things, wrong ways of doing things. It must ultimately show us the issue of destiny. So any worldview rooted for transformation must give us an answer in the area of origins. Where did we come from? Who created the world? It must give us meaning. That life is not just haphazard, that life has a purpose. It must teach us about morality, what to do, what not to do. It must teach us about destiny. Paul says, if only in this world we have hope, we are of most men miserable. So remember, the altar we want to raise, raise must give us the essence of life, origin how the world and man came into existence, meaning the original intention behind existence, the purpose of being, why am I here? Morality, the ethical basis for determining what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is false. And then ultimately destiny, the end of life beyond the physical, the ultimate place of rest for mankind, issues of metaphysics. So today, many Christians raise altars of education, but they don't give us an idea of origin because it's never taught, or rather, we are taught evolution. They don't give us the essence of meaning that every life that God created has a meaning, that we're not just here, we go to school, we get married, we bear children, we enjoy ourselves, that's all. No, that's not the kind of institution that will bring transformation. Many don't have issues of morality, and I'll talk about all this. So 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19 says, if it is in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we are of most men miserable. So look at the altar we want to raise, raise it must contend with the humanist agenda. Any altar of education raised by any Christian that does not contend with the humanist agenda is a wasted effort. Is a wasted effort. Now, notice that the doctrines of humanism is part of what this altar must contend with. Humanism is the belief that Man is the architect of his own fortune. He has no need for God. In fact, deity is irrelevant. So part of humanism that God is irrelevant. And notice whether it's in Canada, in the US, in Africa, in UK, many educational institutions now teach that deity is irrelevant. Now, notice that we must contend with that idea. We must contend with the idea of the supremacy of human reason. Human reason is necessary, but human reason is not supreme. Human reason is not because it is fallible. But this is what we have to contend in such an altar. Then that progress is inevitable. Progress is not inevitable. There are things we do to have progress. There are things we do we won't have progress. And progress is not only in the physical sense of the world. Then there is this idea that science is the only guide to progress. That's not true. Faith is a guide to progress. Knowledge of God is a guide to progress. But humanism tells us that science is the only guide to progress. And then 
humanism teaches that man is autonomous. So it teaches the autonomy and centrality of man. So don't forget that the altar we raise must contend with the humanist agenda. And what is the humanist agenda? That deity is irrelevant. That human reason is supreme. That progress is inevitable. That science is the only guide to progress and then the authority of man. So I, I, I like to draw your attention to the Humanist Manifesto, volume two. The Humanist Manifesto, volume two says, no deity will save us. We must save ourselves. And this is what defines education today globally. That reason can save us, man can save us, but of course you know, all have seen and conscious of the glory of God. Man is infallible. Huh? And uh, uh, man is fallible, rather, only God is infallible. So no deity will save us, says the Humanist Manifesto, Volume 2. And it's important we understand that this is what we are contending with. Now, the altar we raise must engage in a fight with darkness. It's a contention. A fight with darkness. And this fight is in the form of humanists as sons of Greece versus Christians as sons of Zion. Humanists as sons of Greece versus Christians as sons of Zion. It's a contention. It's a scriptural contention. So nobody who wants to raise this altar for transformation, educational transformation globally, will go and do it for the purpose of just making money. No, you're entering into a fight. And the fight is the fight of humanists as sons of Greece versus Christians as sons of Zion. The picture of this fight is in Zechariah chapter nine. Verse 12 to 14. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 12 to verse 14. It says, return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. I like to be a prisoner of hope. It doesn't matter how bad things are. Oh, there's hope that it can come, or it can be transformed, it can change. So return to the stronghold. Return to the stronghold of the word. Return to the stronghold of the altar. Because every altar is a stronghold of light. So return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today, I declare that I will restore double to you. For I have bent Judah, my bow, fitted the bow with Ephraim, and raised up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece. I have raised up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece. I made you like the sword of a mighty man. Then the Lord will be seen over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will blow the trumpet and go with the wild wind from the south. So Zechariah 9 says, God has raised sons of Zion to contend with the sons of Greece. So if you raise an altar of education for transforming uh, uh, nations globally, understand that you're entering into a battlefield. The battlefield of humanists as sons of Greece in contention with Christians as sons of Zion. So it, it's important we notice that this is vital. Now, so let me show us a graphical picture or what we are contending with. 
notice that we're contending with the structures put in place by Alice Bailey. The Alice Bailey uh, had a 10 point agenda. Her 10 point agenda was one, take God and prayer out of educational system, the educational system. This has largely happened in America. Prayer has been taken out of schools. In Nigeria, there are many government schools you cannot pray. So that agenda has already been fulfilled. Two, reduce parental authority over children. Again, this is what's happening in many schools. Reduce parental authority over the children. Then three, I think before this meeting today, my wife was telling me about a parent that went to a school and saw pictures, nude pictures, lewd pictures on the wall of the classroom and contended with the teacher. Unfortunately, they sent security to take her out. So you reduce parental authority over children. Three, destroy the Judeo-Christian family structure. Again, she has largely succeeded in many contexts. This is our agenda. Destroy the Judeo-Christian family structure. Four, make abortion legal and easily accessible. Again, many nations that had anti-abortion laws have now legalized abortion. In America, for instance, abortion is still a contention, but it is largely, until recently, accessible to whoever had it. I know that an 11-year-old girl cannot pierce her ear without parental, uh, parental consent, but she could go to school, and if she were pregnant, go to a school abortion clinic without her parents' consent and have an abortion. Uh, and so if you notice what we're contending, we were contending with darkness at a level we've never seen before. Five, make divorce easy as a means of liberation from the bondage of marriage. That's a, 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 one of our 10 point agenda. Six, make homosexuality an alternative lifestyle. Uh, not too long ago, when you hear gay, it means happy, joyful. Now it is an alternative lifestyle. Seven, debase art and make it run mad. Again, you could see that here, art has been debased and it's like running mad. Eight, use the media to promote and change mindset. Use the media. Yeah, that's why today you want to advertise engineering equipment, you use a naked woman. You want to advertise blade, use a man in boxers. Nine, create an interfaith movement. An interfaith movement is a religious movement that combines or encourages the mixture of religions. That's why uh, during 9-1-1, the September 11 terrorist strike, if you remember, they had an interfaith service in the National Cathedral. Uh, Billy Graham preached, a Buddhist monk preached, a Sikh man preached, a Muslim preached. So create an interfaith movement and then turn, get governments, educational institutions, and the church to endorse all these things. So Alice Bailey's 10 point agenda is an educational agenda that promotes darkness. And you can see that to a large extent she has succeeded. This woman was born in June, on June 16, 1880, and died December 15, 1949. Now, she, at the age of 15, was visited by a spirit guide who told her about her assignment. So you can see that she came inspired by Satan to fulfill an educational assignment that had a societal and national and global agenda. She and her husband established the Lucifer Publishing Company. Now, the Lucifer Publishing Company 
had the very first foundational contract for printing the United Nations publications at its inception. It was called Lucifer Publishing Company. Now, when the name Lucifer Publishing Company became a problem, she shortened it to Lucy's Trust. Lucy's Trust. Lucy's Trust is still an NGO today. Now, she championed the feminist agenda that eventually led to the Feminist Declaration of 1971. Now, what is that feminist declaration? The Feminist Declaration for 1971, it says, marriage has existed for the benefit of man and has been a legally sanctioned method of control over women. We must work to destroy it. We must work to destroy it. The end of the institution of marriage is a necessary condition for the liberation of women. Therefore, it is important for us to encourage women to leave their husbands. Please don't leave your husbands willing women. Stick with your husbands. She said all of history must be written in terms of the oppression of women. We must go back to the ancient female religions like witchcraft. So notice what came into education as far back as the 1940s and how it has transformed education today for bad. Now, it is important to begin to bring the biblical dimension of education very early in the life of ch children. If this altar must survive, if this altar must be an instrument of transformation. And Deuteronomy chapter six, verse six to nine is the guide at all levels. It says, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently. The key word there is diligently unto thy children. Thou shalt talk of them when thou seekest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when you're stationary, when thou risest up, when you're mobile, and you shall bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes, and you shall write them upon the post of thy house and thy gates. Now, this is the foundational scripture for the kind of altar we want to raise at all levels. Now, if you look at Daniel, Daniel had that kind of education. And Daniel became a celebrity of God in Babylon. Now, um, notice that God is looking for us to raise this altar at a very early stage. If you look at Daniel, Daniel was raised on the basis of the scripture I cited. He was part of the king's uh, children of Zion. He was an, a, a king's seed. He was a prince. He was one of the best. Now, notice that when they left from Jerusalem to Babylon, the systems of education in Babylon attempted to transform Daniel in line with the humanistic agenda, satanic agenda. So, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he will not defile himself with the king's meat. Daniel and his friends, because of a solid kingdom foundation, retained their original character and identity, notwithstanding the training they got. So if we raise this altar and we start with children at their earliest level, the 
we will raise Daniel type of people who are 10 times better than their fellows, who purpose in their heart that they will not defile themselves with the king's meat. People who will be young, they will understand science as Daniel did, having ability without blemish, they are cunning, skilled in knowledge. They have ability to serve in the king's court. They are well favored. They are full of grace and they are teachable. These are the characteristics of Daniel, even at the point they were being introduced to the university system of Babylon. But what was responsible for the solidity of their foundation? It was this scripture, these words, which I command thee this day shall be in your heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto your children. That's what laid the foundation. So by the time Daniel and his friends left Babylon, left Jerusalem and went to Babylon, they maintained the foundation of the altars that were raised in their life. Remember that in Babylon, they tried to change their identity. That's what the humanistic educational systems that we are raising an altar to change will attempt to do. Look at their original names, and they gave them new names. A name is symbolic of character. A name is symbolic of identity. A name is the most constant prophecy of somebody's life. Daniel's name God is my judge. But they gave him the name of an idol, Bel Teshazzar. That is Bel, protect his life. Hananiah, Yahweh has been gracious. Wonderful name. But they gave him the name of an idol, Shadrach. That is, he's under the command of an idol called Aku. Mishael, who is like God. They gave him a name, Meshach, the shadow of a prince. Shadows are not realities. Azariah, Yahweh has helped me. But they gave him the name Abednego, servant of Nego, an idol. Now, my point is this. The foundation that was laid in the four Hebrew children, even as early as five years to 10 years, 10 years to 17 years when they were taken to Babylon was so solid that when they gave them a new identity, that identity did not change their character. Remember that names are symbolic of character identity and they're the most constant prophecy of a person's uh, life. So the altar we raise must be diligent to focus the youngest of our children. And that means that this educational system must begin at home. So that by the time we do it at home, when they go out to sometimes the worldly educational system, the solidity of what we did at home will be able to protect them from every pervert idea. Proverbs 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, now in the worldly systems, now in the universities that don't have the godly foundation, he will not depart from it. So we must understand that contention in that area is important. Then this altar must promote the educational philosophy of Christ. The altar that will bring educational transformation globally must promote the educational philosophy of Christ. Notice I had mentioned the fact that his educational philosophy uh, is rooted in the fact that he, he taught us our origins, uh, gave us meaning to life, showed us what it means to be moral, and ultimately pointed us to our destiny in eternity. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11 says, No other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. The educational philosophy of Jesus Christ answers questions about the essence of life, which we began with. It tells us about our origin, our meaning, 
the moral fiber that should drive us and our ultimate destiny. So let me briefly paint a picture of the educational philosophy of Christ, which must be the philosophy of the altars of education that we raise for transforming individuals globally. Notice that his educational philosophy was egalitarian in nature. He wanted everybody educated, irrespective of, uh, of, of age. Let the children come to me, he said, irrespective of financial status, it was egalitarian. So this altar must find a way of bringing everybody. His educational philosophy that it was free and inexpensive in cost. Of course, we understand the global economy. We cannot insist, but we must do a lot to ensure that it is affordable to every person. And whoever cannot afford it, we look for a system of raising resources to help the people who cannot afford this educational system. I understand a, that money is fundamental for the things we do, but notice that this educational system was free and inexpensive. In other words, many of the institutions we raise today, very expensive, the churches. In fact, many churches come to congregation to raise money to start schools, but their congregants cannot pay the school fees. Their pastors cannot send their children to those schools. What must we do to ameliorate this? This is where we can do sponsorship. We have an educational institution we were able to raise as part of our ministry in Ghana. This is the Intercessors for Africa. Um, Barista Mecca uh, uh, is the chairman of the SALT Institute. The SALT Institute is a leadership institute to train leaders in government. I am on the board of the SALT Institute and uh, SALT Institute has now been accredited to award degrees and so I came back to lecturing because I still do it pro bono. So in order to ameliorate the cost of the education, I do teaching in Salt Institute. I teach a master's degree program. I supervise students. In fact, before this meeting, I was online with my students in Accra, Ghana. Some of them are in South Africa. And everything I do in the Salt Institute, whether as a member of the board, or as a lecturer is free, is done pro bono. So there is a way, and then we get people to sponsor students. His educational philosophy was geared towards character transformation. So the altar we raise for transformation must transform character. The cerebral is important, but the organic is even more important. There are degrees you have from Oxford, but those degrees are of no consequence because there is no character. And I'm not just talking of Oxford, every other institution. So for this altar, educational altar to bring global transformation, it must be geared towards character transformation. Then his educational philosophy was directed to behavior modification. Today, many people go for the certification, not behavior modification. If you have a piece of paper that says you are certified, but there is no behavior modification, there was no track throughout your time in school, there's no bad habit you stop. Rather, you increase your bad habits. Then that institution is of no use. It's not an altar of transformation. It's an altar of degeneration. Then he's educational philosophy, it was universal in focus. Notice that it was non-certificate driven. That is not to say certificates are not important, but the focus is not a certificate. It's not a certificate. It was meant for both the rich and the poor, and it was vocational in content. Notice that it was vocational in content because you understood that integrity must come not just in the context of integrity of heart, 
for skillfulness of hand also. So this is the altar we ought to raise, an altar of global education for transformation that is egalitarian in nature, free and inexpensive in cost, geared towards character transformation, directed towards behavior modification, universal in focus because we're willing women worldwide, non-certificate driven even though we can give certificates, meant for both the rich and the poor and vocational in content. So that when somebody goes through school, is it that you come out learning to sew, learning carpentry, learning a trade, because that's how Jesus himself learned and went to school. So it is important that if you look at the people Jesus raised as part of his transformation agenda from the educational point of view, he raised mass communicators. He raised craftsmen or the kind of altar must raise mass communicators, craftsmen, civil engineers, doctors, priests, civil servants, and the rest of them. Now, it is important that we understand that any such altar that does not center on the philosophy of Jesus in education will not be transformational. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 18. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 18, it says, He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. The key word is that in every educational system, Christ must have the preeminence. In every subject, in every discipline, Christ must have the preeminence. So education can never be truly effective and positive without Christ. That's all I've been saying. So this altar must be raised on the foundation of the knowledge of Christ. Education for transformation can never be truly effective and productive transforming without Christ. Now, I, I remember giving a lecture at the University of Makerere. This is some years ago now. The University of Makerere is one of the foremost universities in Africa, it is about 100 years old plus now. At the celebration of the 50th anniversary, the Jubilee anniversary of the Faculty of Information, Computer and Information Science, I was called to give a lecture. And the title of my lecture was Humanism and the Challenges of the Information Age. Humanism and the challenges of the information age. That was my, uh, my topic. Now, in a lecture format, you have to submit your lecture and then there will be a respondent. So I threw two bombs there because I knew that I was a son of Zion in contention with the sons of Greece in an institution that was raised to promote humanism and not Christ. So I knew I was in a war front. It was at the Senate building and I threw two bombs. I said, there is a biblical curriculum for every subject and there's a Christ dimension for every subject. Now that sounds crazy. You can say that among Christians and get away with it, but you don't go to a, a university 
that does not promote the kind of things I'm talking about and throw that kind of, but that's what we need to do. We are unapologetic these days because the society has gone a bonkers. There's decay because we have always been insular and we don't want to take challenges. So I said there is a biblical curriculum for every subject. There's a Christ dimension to every discipline. Now, during the uh, response, one professor stood up and said, what nonsense. What nonsense that there's a biblical curriculum for every subject. The Bible that we don't even know if it's a myth or if it's a reality. The second one came and said, what nonsense. What nonsense that there's a Christ dimension to every subject, every discipline. Christ who we do not even know about his historicity or whether he was a historical figure. So notice that at that point, the entire audience had been swayed. And I was praying silently and saying, Lord, give me an opportunity to turn the hearts of men. Now, it's vital that education must transform the hearts of men to believe in the authority of scripture, in the indispensability of the philosophy of Christ as the greatest educational philosopher of philosophers. And so when it was now the public forum, I, people lifted their hand to ask questions. I was led by the spirit to pick up a woman. And then she said, sir, I'm just hearing something I've never heard before that there's a biblical curriculum for every subject, and that there's a Christ dimension to every discipline. I am born again. I teach physics, and particularly I teach astronomy. But the physics I teach and the astronomy I teach has nothing to do with the Bible, which I believe in. It has nothing to do with Christ, whom I believe in. So can you explain to me how there's a biblical curriculum for astronomy. I hear the sigh of relief because it was my opportunity to move from lecture to preaching. I said, Madam, I'm so delighted to hear that you're born again and that you're head of the Department of Physics. I said, do you remember Psalm 19, verse 1 to 5? She said, no. Remember this time you had the war from, I, I couldn't carry a Bible because a Bible will will in fact get the people not to see to listen to me. So the word of God had to be inside me. So I quoted Psalm 19, verse 1 to 5. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmaments show forth his praise. Day unto day, utter speech. Night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no language in the world where their voice is not heard. So... I said, the stars you teach your children in the classroom, they are preaching the message of redemption. And there's no language where their voice is not heard. They are preaching in the night, they are preaching in the day and teaching in the night. Then I asked her again, do you remember Psalm 147 verse four? She said, no, I said, it says, God has numbered the stars and given each one a name. So all the names of the stars you teach in class, God gave those names. The lecture held in September, so I began to use the dialogic method of communication. So I asked her, this is September, what star? And please, I'm not talking astrology. Astrology is occultic. I'm talking astronomy. Astronomy is scientific and biblical. So I say, which star appears at this time in September when this lecture is holding? She said it's called Virgo. Virgo. Virgo appears between August and September. And if you remember, the angel Gabriel came to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, in the sixth month. The sixth month is August, September. The sixth month of the Bible is August, September came to Mary, the exact time that Virgo as a star appears to preach the message of redemption. So Virgo actually is the prophetic appellation of the virgin that gave birth to the seed of promise. 
By the time I brought this on, I noticed a hush came over the audience. Then I say, you're a woman. I said to her, you're a woman. And you know, Angel, uh, Mary, Mary must have carried the seed that was put in her about August, September for nine months. So let's find out when she delivered. So we began to count August, September, October, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April. So she must have delivered in between March and April. So I asked her again, what star appears in March, April? She said, it is called Aries, Aries. So I asked, when you take your telescope and look at Aries, how does Aries look like in the heaven? She said, wait a minute. Aries looks like the lamb that was slain. And I asked her, who is the lamb that was slain? And she shouted, Jesus, with the entire audience. Immediately, I knew I had won over the entire audience. And she looked at me and said, please, sir, can we sit down and develop a fresh curriculum for astronomy? And that's what we did. So she's teaching the Bible in her class now, even though she is in a supposedly secular university. Education can never truly be effective and productive without the word of God and without Christ. And it's important to know that the heart of education is the education of the heart. The heart of education is the education of the heart. And a heart educated is a head enlightened. So the focus of this altar is to educate the heart. The focus of this altar is to educate the heart that is enlightened. Don't forget the heart of education is the education of the heart. So any altar you raise that doesn't transform the heart of the people will not bring transformation because transformation is not just building infrastructure. Transformation is a gravitation from darkness into light. A transformation of the kind that Jesus experienced on the mountain of transfiguration, where the fashion of his countenance was altered. His robe was glistering. I know there are details of what you need to do. You don't go into a classroom to preach. I'll talk about that. But it's important that the motivation is to raise a new generation of people whose hearts is enlightened and whose heads are also enlightened. It is important to understand that there is no other way. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. That's why all manner of things proceed from the heart. Jeremiah 17 verse 19 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can comprehend it? That's why the education that brings transformation must transform the heart. And the heart cannot be transformed unless the curriculum is biblical. The heart cannot be transformed unless Christ is the center of the education. Remember that there are many things the heart, I don't have all the time now. Now, the altar we raise must integrate the kingdom agenda in curriculum development. I had hinted this. The educational altar that will bring transformation must integrate the kingdom agenda I've described with curriculum development. Notice that the curriculum of a school is a key element of any attempt to induce behavior modification among students, among staff. Unfortunately, the curriculum today has been largely designed by non-Christians. And, and, and there must be a way of bringing in the Bible, not in the context of the places where today, if they see you carrying a Bible into the classroom, you will be sacked. No, but there is a way you bring it in and even using the curriculum given to you to instill morality, to instill integration. What makes a Christian school is the infusion or integration of a biblical worldview 
that is rooted in the word of God in the curriculum. So it's important we take note of, I say it again, a school is not Christian because it was started by a Christian. A school is not Christian because Christians teach in the school. A school is Christian because the curriculum is Christ-like and is rooted in the word of God. So I don't have the time to go into how to design curriculum and all that. Uh, but it's important we take note of that. Our thinking must change. Now, look at an example of why nothing seemed to change in our nation, particularly Nigeria. Now, when you look at the unity schools, the government, federal government colleges, you see all manner of evil going on there because of the policy of injustice. Now, the cut-off mark for Anambra State for those who are male, who want to be admitted, is 139. That of female, also 139. But at the same time, the cut-off mark for students from Yobe in the same school is two for male and 27 for female. Now that's madness. While the cutoff point for those from Enugu State is 134 marks for men and 134 marks for women, the cutoff mark for students from Zamfara, male is four and female is four. Now what you raise here is an unjust system an unjust system that promotes wickedness. That's why, and this happens because Christ is not the center of activity here. The same is true for Sokoto. Cut off mark to enter into a federal government college for those from Sokoto is nine marks. For female is three. But for Delta, it is 131. It means therefore, that somebody from Delta who scores 130 cannot enter into this school, but somebody who scored nine can enter for me. It's madness. These are the things that breed injustice. Psalm 89 verse 4 says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before you. So whatever altar we raise must represent righteousness, must represent justice, because the throne of God is built on four pillars. The pillar of righteousness, the pillar of justice, the pillar of mercy, and the pillar of truth. Now, the altar we raise must ensure that the kingdom agenda is part of school management because when you talk of transformation, if the school management is not transformed, the educational institution will not be transformed. The hearts of the people will not be transformed. So ensure that the kingdom agenda of this altar you want to raise also affects the school management. School management. Notice that school management must also be born again. The management, don't say this person has a degree in Oswald. Is the person born again if you want to raise this kind of altar? John 23 says, Jesus has done and said unto him, Most assuredly I say unto you, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't see the kingdom, you can't see the agenda I'm describing, you won't understand the essence. You will not know that prayer is absolutely indispensable in a school. You will say it's irrelevant. We're not in a church, but an altar is a place of worship. Whether the altar is a business or the altar is a school or the altar is a shop, it's a place of worship. It's a place of interaction of spirits. And those who do not belong to the kingdom cannot see the spirit of God and can't enter. Now, so in the area of the school management, employing the, uh, uh, the raising a management structure that has capacity, 
as much as possible, employ teachers that are genuinely born again. Employ teachers that are genuinely born again. Practice what you preach before students. It's because everything reproduces after its own kind. Everything reproduces after its own kind. If the students see a, a character and attitude that is not Christ-like, whether you tell them to do it or not, they will do it because everything represents after its own kind. Insist on a zero tolerance for exam malpractices. There was a case where a lecturer was now doing uh, uh, solving problems in the class for a student, in another class for a student. There have been cases where parents are the ones doing exams for their children insist on a zero tolerance for exam mark processes. I had a challenge because the church has become worldly today. Now, more than 35 years ago, I had an opportunity to go to a Bible school. And I went to this Bible school and I thought a Bible school is where Bible should dictate our character and Christ should be our standard. Unfortunately, during the exam, I noticed the teacher just left trusting that these are pastors, they won't cheat. But as the exam began and he left, I saw pastors who brought out their notes, their Bibles, and were copying. I was so infuriated that I stood up, even though I was part of the exam, I stood up and said, all of you pastors, if you don't put back your Bibles and put back your, your text, I will walk out of this exam hall. And heaven will record that I didn't take this exam because you were cheating. I had the same problem in a university. I had gone to go and brush up myself. This was after several years of lecturing and I had even stopped lecturing and God said, go back to school. I entered the exam hall. I saw pastors who I know belong to churches, elders, and they were cheating. So <laughs> you cannot uh, 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 insist on zero tolerance for exam matter if you yourself, you are not truly born again. So management must insist on a zero tolerance for exam matter. Then promote integrity of heart, skillfulness of heart, abhor plagiarism among teachers and students. This is a major matter. I remember some uh, the man Selwyn Hughes I was going to Ghana. This is also about 30 years ago. I was going for ministry. I got to Ghana to minister, and I was privileged to be on radio, Capital Radio in Kumasi. And as I spoke, a Bible school president, I, I, I heard what I, I, I said, maybe liked it, and decided to autograph his book on counseling for me. Now, before I left the city of Potako to Ghana, I had this impression, pick up Selwyn Hughes' book on counseling. I resisted because I was going to teach on counseling, so I left it. Selwyn Hughes is late now. He used to write the devotional every day uh, with Jesus. So I went to Ghana and I received this book, supposedly written by a, the president of a Bible school, and as I opened the book, every page, I knew I had read this book. I knew I had seen this book. When I came back to Putakot, interestingly, Selwyn Hughes was in town at the Civic Center teaching. I brought out this book and brought out this particular counseling book written by this man in Ghana. And it was word for word. It was word for word. And the madness was that part of his acknowledgement was, I thank my wife and my children who uh, suffered so much when I was writing this book. Meanwhile, it was stolen. Plagiarism is this root word for kidnapping. The term plagiarism is derived from the Latin word plagiarus, plagiarus. It means plunderer, one who forcibly robs people or places of goods or valuables. It also means kidnapper, 
one who seizes and forcibly carries away a person usually for ransom. So integrity of heart will produce integrity of heart. But if we do not live right, we cannot raise this kind of altar, we'll be joking. So it's important we note Romans 2, verse 21 to 24. Romans 2, verse 21 to 24. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among Gentiles because of you as it is written. Now, the instructions from Romans chapter 2, verse 21 to 24, is indispensable for those that will raise these altars of educational transformation. Teach others, but also teach yourself. Don't steal and tell others not to steal. Don't commit adultery and tell others not to, uh, 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 to, uh, not to be in, uh, 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 impure. Don't preach against idolatry and then rob schools. Now, let me begin to wrap up. Ensure the kingdom agenda includes co-curricular activities. Co-curricular activities. If you must raise an altar that will bring global transformation, ensure that the kingdom agenda of the school of the educational institution includes co-curricular activities. Now, to paint a scriptural picture of what I mean by co-curricular activities, take note of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Paul was in prison and he said, bring the cloak that I left with Capos at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Now notice that Paul made requests for three things, the cloak. The cloak is a sleeveless garment meant for the body. Books, books are intellectual materials meant for the mind, the soul. Then parchments, parchments are scriptures meant for the spirit. So notice that while in prison, Paul was asking for three things, cloaks for the body, books for the mind, parchments for the spirit. Now, what does this mean? Yes, many people focus on only academic enterprise. That's good, but it's not good enough. We need to understand that the body needs to be ministered to as part of raising an altar. I know some people deride the scripture, bodily exercise profits little. Yes, little may be little, but profit in little is better than profit in nothing. So understand the body needs to be attended to. The mind, yes, needs to be attended to, but the spirit also. And notice that many people attend to the mind and the spirit, but the body is important. The body is the landlord of the mind and the spirit, the soul and the spirit. And if the body is not right, notice that if the landlord is not happy, you will be ejected. So if you don't minister to the body, it means that huh, the landlord will eject you. And once the landlord rejects you, you go back to your father. Remember, the body is the landlord of the spirit and the soul. That means the soul and the spirit are tenants in the body. So co-curricular activities are not only for students, but also for teachers. It's for willing women, it's for all of us. What does that imply? It implies that as part of our transformation, if you notice the scripture I cited, in 2 Timothy, 
the scripture I cited in Second Timothy, it says that the body is central. It was mentioned first. And so it's important we take note of that. So in conclusion, that instructions of raising educational altars for global transformation. What are these instructions? We need to repent of promoting humanistic ideas. You know, let me say this, to raise an altar, you need to go back to the first three statements of Jesus on the cross. The first three statements of Jesus on the cross is the pattern for raising altar. Remember Jesus on the altar said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. He didn't say forgive me because he had never sinned. So the first part of raising an altar is repentance. We must repent. Repent of promoting humanism. Repent of a lifestyle that is not exemplary. Repent of cheating Repent of helping others to give them repentance. Then the second thing Jesus said on the cross was to uh, the thief on the cross. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. It was being vertical alignment. Every altar we raise must be aligned with the Lamb's altar in heaven because no educational institution that independent of heaven's educational institution can survive. Heaven actually has educational institutions. Wherever you have books, there are schools. Heaven has edu continuous education. We have a system of, say, I have finished school. There's nothing like that in heaven. You can't finish school. It's continuous education. You must align the altar you raise with the Lamb's altar in heaven, which is an educational institution, perpetual educational institution. Then the third statement he made was to his mother and to his, uh, John, the beloved his friend. He says, woman, behold your son. Son, behold. So it was being horizontal alignment. So it was being vertical alignment, horizontal alignment. Vertical alignment, horizontal. Notice that that represents the Any altar we raise with us, the cross that is the power of transformation. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. The message of the cross is foolishness to them that are perishing. But for us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So this altar of transformation is rooted on the cross. So any educational institution, any teacher, any student that is not functioning, on the basis of the cross, which speaks of self-denial, death to self, so we can resurrect to life, we need to repent of promoting humanistic ideals. Then establish altars on the basis of the essence of life. Teach people their origin. Teach us the fact that life has meaning and help them to discover the meaning that will keep them alive. Teach them that morality is indispensable and that there is a destiny in eternity. Then contend with the humanist worldview and agenda that demotes God, defies man, dis the, uh, the despises scripture. Then promote the educational philosophy of Christ. Remember, his educational philosophy was egalitarian. He wanted everybody educated. His educational philosophy was free and inexpensive even though I put a rider to that. He believed in character uh, modification, behavior transformation. We must promote that educational philosophy. Then we must integrate the kingdom agenda in curriculum development as a biblical curriculum for, for social studies, for mathematics, for chemistry. You need to discover it or go to those that have discovered it because you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So integrate the kingdom agenda of raising this educational altar in the context of curriculum development. They ensure that the kingdom agenda is part of school management. So school management must be kingdom-minded. Then combine the kingdom agenda with co-curricular activities as I described. 
Remember that the heart of education is the education of the heart. And a heart educated is a head enlightened. God bless you.